So welcome everyone. I am Steve Reifenberg. I teach here at the Keough School of Global Affairs. Just delighted to be, my role is simply to welcome everyone. Um, that this room is called the mediation room. It was a space very intentionally designed where everybody can look at one another. There's simultaneous translation, there's observation booths for thinking about kind of major international or ethnic negotiations, conversations, dialogues. But very, very often people see the word, the, the mediation room, and say, oh, you work in the meditation room. And it feels particularly appropriate today um, with Dr. David Germano um, here to um, um, be thinking about contemplation and meditation. And so I'm going to ask a colleague who's helped um, organize this um, visit that's been co-sponsored by a number of university um, units, including two here at the Keough School, the Lu Institute for Asian and Asian Studies, the Ansari um, Institute for the Global Engagement of Religion, and we have the director, uh, Mahan Mirza, here, um, as well as the Transformational Leadership Program, the Anne Bryce Scholars um, Program, the Student Wellbeing um, Program, the McDonald or McWell Program, and the director, um, Megan Brown, is here. And finally, another of the co-sponsors is the Center for Social Concerns, and Jay Brandenburg Burr from the Center for Social Concerns is going to introduce Thank you, Steve. Good to see you all and so many good faces and friends. And I'll be really brief. Um, we've been uh, fortunate to have David join us for uh, since Tuesday. We're, we're putting him to work. And uh, we were just reflecting on what we've learned and what our takeaways were. And mostly it was about intentionality in universities to think across boundaries and missions to collaborate for student flourishing. Um, and so we all have about 74 ideas. Uh, thanks to David. So that's really good. Quickly, I'm going to introduce Dominic Vachon, who will, this is how we do it, Megan said in higher education, uh, <clears throat> uh, who will introduce David. And Dominic is a very authentic human being. That's the first, first uh, criteria. And um, a friend. And Dominic is a seeker. And he is, uh, through psychology and so many other realms, psychology couldn't hold him uh, sufficiently uh, and narrowly. And uh, he is the director in the College of Science of the Hillebrand Center for Compassionate Care and Medicine. Um, and that's a, a serious work to uh, engage our medical professionals, et cetera, in thinking about the care that they do. Um, and the author of a book called How Doctors Care. So um, welcome, Dominic. Yeah. Jay, thank you for that very mm -hmm. kind introduction. Um, I just have to relate my excitement. Well, first of all, that I get to introduce uh, Dr. David Germano. The other one is to be in this room. Um, I've gone by this room and misread it as the meditation room. I almost felt like today would be fitting that we just stuck a little tea in there in your honor. Uh, um, but the other one is a childlike desire or childish desire to be in this room. Like I've gone by and like going, I can't wait to go to a talk in there or do a class in here. So this is um, a double pleasure, but more of a pleasure to introduce you. But I'm glad that we're here and, uh, and that you all who did all this work to organize this, uh, chose this room. So let me tell you a little bit about um, Professor Germano. Professor Germano grew up here in South Bend. Um, my wife, MJ, knows the Germano family. We talked at lunch of like, they knew. Uh, oh my gosh, well, hello. <laughs> Greetings from MJ Murray and the Murray family. Uh, they told me all about you last night, like, what a great family. So I'm so glad to meet you. I, I'd like to take your picture to bring it to MJ, uh, <laughs> since she was talking about you. Um, he was a Notre Dame graduate. He graduated in 1984 um, with a BA in philosophy. Um, but we, we would dare not say that the major in philosophy contained him either. Uh, when we were starting to talk, because I was around that same time, I found out that he was trying to <clears throat> weave together things that uh, foreshadowed his future work. Uh, 
Uh, for example, there weren't many classes on Asia and Asian religion at the time. And so how, and so he's described a little bit about how he um, worked that and, and uh, got a wonderful education from here. Uh, you lived in Grace Hall, is that correct? You lived in Grace Hall. He went on uh, uh, to get a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison focusing on uh, Buddhist and Tibetan studies. He spent over a decade living and uh, studying where there are high numbers of Tibetan, Buddhists, and other Buddhists in countries like Tibet and China and Bhutan and India, Nepal. Um, uh, as I get to know uh, Professor Germano, I, I, my sense is that he epitomizes what we want in scholarship, that your scholarship would be a way uh, to make the world a better place. And so, as I get to know the work, the wonderful work he's done at the University of Virginia, uh, he's responsible for many initiatives in Tibetan studies, um, including directing a, a major Tibetan and Himalayan um, library, the UVA Tibet Center, the founding director of Shanti, which is Sciences, Humanities, and the Arts Network of Technological Initiative. And also, he's the um, uh, director of the Contemplative Sciences Center, is that correct? Was, was. okay. Um, he works with uh, many different schools throughout the university, exploring learning and researching and engagement initiatives about contemplation in whatever disciplinary or professional area he's asked to participate in. Uh, what I think really exemplifies this is he, he has appointments in, of course, the Department of Religious Studies, but also the School of Nursing. So uh, he, uh, a major part of his work uh, comes across to me as a benef the benefits of contemplative practices and how to apply that in our time. So taking this wonderful scholarship of ancient Tibetan Buddhism and saying what can, how can we use that wonderful wisdom, which is contemplative science in our time, especially for our students and, uh, and the kinds of things that we're all going through the way that our society is suffering right now. So it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Professor David Gimano with the talk, Contemplation as Generative Capacity, Understanding and Designing contemplative practices. So thanks so much, Dominic, for that kind introduction, and thanks to everybody who's made the last four days such a, uh, a joyous return back to my alma mater, which, for the record, I've been in almost every year of my entire life, childhood and adult life, because uh, my parents still live here. So what I want to talk about today is, is kind of a new initiative that I'm working on that merges things that I've done pretty much my whole adult life. So I've been studying Buddhist contemplation all the way back to my undergraduate years at Notre Dame, and I have a PhD in it, and I teach it at the University of Virginia. And for the last 12 years, I embarked on a, uh, a set of initiatives at the University of Virginia and across the country that focused on thinking about how can something called contemplation be adapted and, and meaningful for a broad variety of, of contexts in our world, higher education, elementary school, um, hospitals, clinics, et cetera. And so while I was doing that work, it was kind of very frenzied, challenging work. It was very much a startup, had to raise a lot of money for it, did a lot of activities. And I kept thinking in the back of my mind as I worked with all these people across the country who are involved with doing such activities, whether meditation or contemplative teachers themselves or people in a variety of professional sectors who think these might have value or do have value in the work that they do, I kept thinking there's like, a, there's got to be a better way to do this. But I really didn't have the time to kind of put that into motion. And so what I'm working on right now with a number of other colleagues is this generative contemplation initiative, which I'll describe in a moment that tries to bring those two worlds together, at least for me, to think about how might we describe the uh, long religious heritage of our species in contemplation in religious traditions, such as Catholicism or Tibetan Buddhism. How might we understand those in a, a somewhat different way from a scholarly perspective that would help us think about ways in which we might design different contemplative futures, both 
potentially within those traditions, but also without those traditions in a set of contexts where people don't necessarily have a religious affiliation. So that's the nature of this talk, um, to try to bring those two worlds together, at least for myself, and it's very much at the beginning point. And um, I'll just warn you, this, this talk is in, in some ways like super rudimentary, and in other ways it can maybe go off the deep end, but if you get worried in either way, don't worry, they'll get more complicated or it'll get more simple. Um, and for those of you who were at my talk yesterday, which was about higher education and, and flourishing and, and contemplation, there's only one slide that's in common here. So when I get to that slide, don't think, oh, wait a second, I already, I already saw those things. <laughs> you saw that one slide, that's it. Um, everything else is, is different. So, oh well, just use my hands. So to begin with, uh, the, re the really rudimentary, uh, we have all these words, words like contemplation, meditation, spiritual exercises, mysticism, yoga, prayer, mindfulness, and so forth. And just to uh, begin with some very simple questions, because when I started this work 12 years ago, I had a long uh, history of studying these traditions from an academic point of view, from a personal point of view, but, you know, when you go really deep inside something, it becomes very hard to actually see anything in a way. And so when people started asking me all these questions, like the, the Phillips Museum in um, Washington, D.C. asked me to help them design contemplative uh, experiences of art, you know, and just looking at all these different contexts, and I was thinking, what do you even mean? I mean, wh what are your expectations when you ask me to do something called contemplative experiences of art or contemplative life in a residential hall, or whatever it might be. And so I thought a lot about these things just in a, a very basic fashion. Like, what do you mean? And, and what do I mean? Like, for example, everyone associates mindfulness with Buddhism. But 12 years ago, I had never used the word mindfulness in my life. If that word even passed between my lips, I'm not quite sure for the first, you know, many decades of my life. And suddenly I'm just hearing mindfulness, mindfulness. You know, it's Buddhism. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. So... <laughs> So the first question is just what? These very rudimentary questions. Uh, look at a particular language, particular tradition, particular community, particular culture, and ask yourself, what, what are the terms that are being used and how are they being defined? What's the typology of activities that fall under these categories? And um, what are their basic dynamics and the context in which these things are done? Just really basic questions. Because what I might understand in Buddhism or possibly in Catholicism, might be very different when I turn to Native American religions or Sufism or um, other religious traditions. Secondly, you know, where? When you look at a particular tradition or a particular culture, how do these relate to other human practices that we engage in, other human activities that we engage in? If you think of that as a kind of um, continuum, how distinctive are these things that we call contemplation or meditation and so forth? And then three, why? Why does one do such practices? What are their values and functions within individual life, within a communal life, within a tradition, within a culture, within a people, and so forth? And then when? When are they applicable to today's world and, and context outside of the religious context in which they continue to be practiced in, in many cases around the world? So if we think about an elementary school, five-year-old kids in a public school system in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the things that I was involved with quite a lot for the last decade. How are they applicable? How are they contextually relevant to kids at that developmental stage and that type of public institution? Or a clinic for pain, one of the most famous contexts in which so-called mindfulness uh, evolved in the North America called mindfulness-based stress reduction and so forth. And finally, how? How does one design new contemplative practices? I can tell you how I did it over the last 11 years under a lot of duress. Like, you know, I'd have a class called Art and Science of Human Flourishing, like uh, taught here by, by Jay at the University of Virginia. Sorry, Notre Dame, not Virginia, that's where I am. And I remember we'd have class on Monday, and I would design those new practices on Sunday, <laughs> every Sunday, you know? So uh, I'm very familiar with how people do so in a kind of non-intentional, non-deliberate, um, non-contemplative manner. But I became interested in, like, how do you understand the religious heritage of contemplation in a really deep-rooted way, and then separately think about how might we design new practices that are applicable to these people in this time, in this context? So these are the kind of very rudimentary framing questions for the thoughts I'm going to give you today. And uh, this is the one shared slide from yesterday, uh, simplified, 
So what is contemplation in simple terms? And this was a thought process I went through myself when people kept asking me, like, mindful this, mindful that. You know, at one point I remember um, I saw in Whole Foods, probably some of you are familiar with it, you know what it is? Mindfulness mayo. <laughs> and I, I often wondered, like, what is it about this mayonnaise that makes it so mindful? <laughs> and, um, and in the end, I, I think I, I came to the conclusion that what it actually meant was it was organic. So it just sounded better to say mindful because there was so much organic stuff in Whole Foods. So I thought a lot about the way people were using these terms. And uh, I'll give you two examples that I gave yesterday as well. One was talking to the mayor of Charlottesville, and he was discussing the way in which he was using contemplation in teaching kids from uh, kind of challenging socioeconomic backgrounds uh, to play soccer. And he said he taught them to contemplate. And I asked him, what do you mean by contemplate? And for him, it was um, when those kids are in the soccer field and they feel the urge to, um, to rage, he says, give me three seconds, pause, consider, and then do whatever you want. I don't care if you hit them, you trip them, just give me three seconds, just a three second kind of contemplative pause. Or I was talking to a famous professor in the undergraduate school of business, and he said, oh, yeah, contemplation is really important in our school. And I, I thought, what do you mean by that? And he said, I just want to trip them because they're hell-bent to go to Wall Street. And if I can just create a barrier along the pathway, cause them to stumble, cause them to trip, cause them to pause a little bit and be reflective, then that's mission accomplished. And so for him, he was talking about contemplation in that way. Or at the University of Virginia in the uh, hospital system, they introduced a contemplative pause, 60 seconds, on the operating theater when someone dies. And they take 60 seconds together, everyone who was trying to save this life, to bear witness and to collectively process that grief instead of just walking alone to their solitude and sense of failure and, and, and grieving and so forth. So 60 seconds. So when you think about all these things, I think we can see a, a common tendency in how we use contemplation, as well as these very vernacular ways of just meaning like, I'm going to think about it. You know, do you want to go to a picnic? Let me contemplate it. So they all have in common a pause, a temporal element, a, a time gap between a situation and the actions we're going to take in response to that situation, between a stimulus and a response. Get angry on the soccer field, three seconds. Graduate from high school before you go into the job market, four years. Contemplative pause. So then what do those spaces have to be like? Well, for those spaces to be genuinely contemplative in character, they have to have a certain quality of, of quiet, of calm, of safety, of inclusiveness. So you genuinely don't feel pressured. You genuinely don't feel pushed to simply engage in some quick transactional response because of what you think other people expect or what you're habituated to do or what your instinctual response to do. So you need that kind of space for it to be truly contemplative. And then this is a wholly inadequate definition of contemplating, but for the moment I'll give it to you. This is the kind of product of just that thought process of what people were looking for when they use these languages. So contemplating. So once you've got those spaces, how do you contemplate? And the first aspect of contemplation is attention, the capacity to bring our mind to bear upon what's salient, what's important, what matters to us, and to do so in a sustained fashion. If you can't bring your mind to bear on the subject matter, whether it's organic chemistry or another person or a challenge we face as a society today, then contemplation's never going to happen. So you have to be able to bring your attention in a sustained fashion. And once you bring your attention to a sustained fashion to what matters to you today in this contemplation, then you can begin to expand your awareness. You can expand the field of awareness. You can expand the awareness to inner, to outer phenomena, to yourself, to others. You can bring what's on the background of your perception, of your imagination, and bring it to the foreground. You can take content that's perhaps struggling uh, in your unconscious and bring it into your conscious. So you can expand your fields of awareness. And once you expand your fields of awareness, you can reflect, you can analyze, you can consider, you can hold a sustained pattern of reflection for a period of time towards insight, towards wisdom, towards seeing patterns and so forth. And finally, once you do that, you can transcend. You can transcend your limited self. You can transcend your habituated ways of responding to situations. You can transcend towards potentially greater wisdom and greater compassion. So, uh, and one more simple kind of rudimentary slide. Um, let's think about these intentional practices. Now, we have lots of practices that are not intentional. We all know this from a developmental perspective. 
were raised and long before we can be reflective about the practices that we engage in, we have constituted ourself and our experience of the world and our way of relating to self, body, mind, emotions, each other, the world around us, the environment, through a whole series of practices that we have internalized. And my practices were gifted from the city of South Bend, where I spent the first 21 years of my life. So our self, our relationships, our perceptions, our worlds are an outcome of these myriad practices, intentional or not intentional. So with contemplation, we've typically talked about it within a university setting as intentional practices where we can harness them towards flourishing. Intentional practices where because of the work of being able to bring sustained attention to various subject matters of our choice, because of the work of expanding our fields of awareness to include the unconscious, the habitual, those things that lay outside of our, you know, that massive amount of data coming into us and a small amount that we actually pay attention to. So by expanding our fields of awareness, by bringing reflection, by transcending, we can begin to see what those practices are, including practices that we were not aware of. And we can see and glimpse in the sight of our vision the outcomes that they're generating emotional responses we're having to situations, ways we interact with people, different kinds of outcomes that are our life. And we can make a decision that those outcomes aren't who I want to be, they are not aligned with my values, and so I will intentionally choose other practices, other practices that generate other outcomes. And so contemplative practices are a subset of those kinds of intentional practices, whether yoga, prayer, mindfulness, meditation, spiritual exercises, concentration, and so forth. And so with that in mind, we can consider these in different contexts. We can look at religious um, heritages, traditions like Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. We can look in secular contexts, and we can look at the so-called SBNR movement, spiritual but not religious, which is this really expanding movement amongst our youth. So many college students say, I'm very spiritual, but not religious. SBNR is what it's called. It's a whole field of academic study. And so at the core of this, um, we'll start with this idea that contemplation are practices working with your intention that are, that are highly intentional, uh, that are experiential, and that are reflexive about the experience, that are paying attention to the emergent experiences that you're having in this process and making potential adjustments based upon those experiences. And that's the end of the kind of more simple slides. So a little bit more elaborate. Let's look at contemplation as a distinctive type of human practice. How do you, how do you make such practices? How do you turn attention into a, a formal practice of attention that might be called contemplation? So these practices of attention are in very different modalities. You could have focused attention, the attention that focuses on a particular point like a flashlight or a laser, open awareness, open forms of attention where you're really bringing in this entire field of your awareness and it's a diffuse type of attention or rapturous attention, attention which is, has this uh, strong emotional valence of, of bliss or joy or empathetic attention and so forth. And with that in mind, um, this is, some of this is very simple, but formal practice sessions. You establish formal boundaries, and during this formal boundary, there's a time and a space, and the time could be duration. How long is this practice for? How frequently do I do it? How regularly do I do it? Once a day, once every other day, once every Sunday? Seasonality, there can be a seasonality to contemplation. Do this in the winter, but not in the spring. Won't make any sense in the spring. And also places. So formal practice sessions, sessions that have um, a boundedness to them, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then within that, the practice, and, and these are all rooted in Tibetan Buddhism, so um, specifying the attentional modality, the objects that you will entertain, and the considerations that you will take. So what kind of attention will you bring during this contemplative session, the next 10 minutes, the next hour, and so forth? Will it be focused attention? Will it be empathetic attention? Will it be attention with an emotional valence to it? And what will be the objects of attention? Or will there be no object at all? Will it be objectless? Or will the object be a saint, or a, a Buddha, or, or, or Jesus, or whoever it might be? Or might it be a color, just a color blue? Or might it be in darkness? There are practices done in pitch black darkness for extended periods of time. So what's the object of your attention? And then what are the considerations or the attitudes or the dispositions that you're bringing to that practice, which might um, revolve around various types of things? And another aspect of, turning, of making a contemplative practice is it involves full, undivided attention. You know, you're not on your cell phone, you're not eating dinner, <laughs> 
You're not doing a broad variety of things, but you're fully in an undivided fashion bringing your attention during this bounded period. And it's not just conceptual. It involves the body, it involves potentially speech. In fact, it always involves body and speech it, it, and mind and um, emotions and so forth. It may involve speech in the sense that you're silent. That's a disposition of speech. It may involve the mind in the sense of it being non-conceptual, or perhaps the mind is heavily analytical, or it's narrating stories in the context of this meditation. Now, there's also going to be a procedural script of some type or another, and I spent a lot of my life studying practices that are very much opposed to procedural scripts, but even those have a procedural script. It's the absence of the script. Um, so they can be tightly script, scripted, do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and really it can make you think like, What's the boundary between ritual and contemplation, which is a complex kind of issue? Or it can be open with a lot of room for indeterminacy, for adaptation, for emergent things to be happening that you don't predict in character. And there can be specific techniques that for physical postures, static postures or moving postures or gestures, uh, mental postures like the attitudes that you're taking towards this work, the emotional valence of it, the attentional modalities, or verbal postures, chanting, silence, um, et cetera. And then in addition, you have explicit framing goals, which can take a, the same set of procedures and turn it into a totally different contemplation. For example, if I say, hey, um, Joe, do this contemplation to help with your back problems. It'd be great for you. And Joe's like, yes, I'm going to do it. For the sake of my back problems, I engage in this meditation. And I can tell Steve, Steve, tell him the same meditation. Steve, this is for your ultimate liberation. And Steve's like, oh, great, he told me the secret, you know. So, so now when he meditates, he thinks to himself, I'm doing this for the sake of this insight into reality. So these framing goals uh, could be liberatory, could be pragmatic, could be remedial for physical or emotional issues, or could be aiming at insight into reality, union with God, personal transformation. Um, and then there's, this, there's two slides like this, so sorry. Uh, deliberate intentionality, that you, you have an intention behind this. You have an intention for what you're doing. And you have an intention that these practices are going to have certain outcomes that there's an expectation of. And this can also take the form of surrendering intentionality. That can be an intention, that I intend to not have any intention in this practice. And also I can surrender my agency. So contemplative practices are not all these deliberate, rational, guided kinds of things. I could surrender my agency and let the grace of God or the grace of the Buddhas fill me up and their agency becomes paramount. So, then the art and science of experience. Experience is absolutely crucial. Experience is constantly monitored in these contemplative practices. You're watching, how does your body feel? How does your mind feel? What's emerging in your perception and so forth? And you're making adjustments based upon what you notice in the experiences. And so when we did the work with the Phillips Art Museum, this is one of the things um, that we did, we, 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 we made these guided meditations for these prominent artworks. One was the boating party, one was the Rothko room, and one was a room of beeswax um, by some German beeswax artist, I guess. I don't know if he specialized in beeswax, but um, it smelled very nice. So we asked people as they were encountering the artworks, we all know how people mostly experience artwork in museums, right? It looks like this. You, know, you glance at the, the title, you look at the thing, and you walk on. So they had to stop, they had to give it their full attention, and they had to watch for what experiences happened as they looked over the details of this. What emotional um, resonances occurred, or how were their, their minds drawn in this way, or what twitch did they feel in their, their, their left arm, or whatever. So look at these experiences. And also look for signs and measures of progress, that there are things that are said, if this experience happens, it's a sign that you're going uh, in, a, in, a, in the right way. It's a milestone of types, and now you can begin to engage in this part of the practice. Or there are signs that tell you, you've just hit a major obstacle, and you need to uh, bring some techniques for this contemplative practice to overcome those obstacles. So the whole variety of, of ways in which experience factors critically. Reliance upon a teacher, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, like Catholicism, you have literally hundreds of thousands of pages of text about these practices, about the procedural techniques, the context, the experiences. They theorize it, they narrate it, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read those, and I know a lot of people in this, in, I mean, our, our world is a world where we read a text and we do something, right? So I know a lot of people in North America who just read a text and do things. But 
Obviously, there's something, uh, I hope, special, being at a university about teachers. And teachers of contemplation can be responsive, they can be adaptive, they can take in response um, their own experience and the unfolding specific experiences you have, which, you know, I know for those of us who are obsessed with text, of which I am one, we feel that texts talk to us, but they actually don't. Like they're not cognizant of the fact that we're in the room, whereas another human, uh, of course, is. I don't really believe that. I know texts talk to me, but. Um. <laughs> and then there's the aesthetics of contemplation. Thinking of contemplation as an aesthetic activity, which has always been first and foremost how I've thought about contemplation. Uh, when I was here at Notre Dame, uh, probably one of the, well, definitely one of the most uh, seminal influences I had was from uh, Professor John Mathias in the English department, who, for unknown reasons, kind of grabbed me and said, hey, you're going to do this, this, and this. And for the next three years, he taught me how to write poetry and appreciate poetry. And so aesthetics and aesthetic experiences have always been fundamental for my life. And so when I first encountered contemplation, I was always asking the question, um, how does this relate to the way that you contemplate a poem or you contemplate a work of art or you contemplate a play and so forth? How are they continuous? How are they discontinuous? And for me, I see them as far more convergent than they are divergence, especially if you think of your encounter with music and art and, um, and poetry and so forth in a very deliberate, very intentional way, which a number of people are doing. I have a, 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 someone I know um, from the art world who's done this program in contemplative art experiences where she helps people pull or pick specific artworks that they come back to over and over over time, and she makes it into a contemplative practice um, that links to your life and your experiences. Contemplation is multiple. Uh, you often get normative definitions from all sorts of people, but I mean, I can tell you, when you look at the historical record, it is radically multiple. There are thousands of types of contemplation, and even within a single lineage, a single author, you'll find multiple definitions and so forth. So extreme diversity, concentration, somatic, bodily things, postural things that involve posture or physical movement, or you visualize things, or you have recipes that you create these sensory things that then you experience in a sensory fashion, or there's performance meditations, there's deconstructive meditations where you perforate uh, the conventional reality and tear it down either through using visualizations or analytical reflections and so forth. There's um, spontaneous, there's letting be, there's breath, there's dreaming, sexuality, emulation of death and so forth, just astonishingly diverse, which might lead you to think, what is not contemplation? That's always a, a challenge, especially these days in America when you have mindfulness mayo. You know, I, I guess the non-organic mayo is not contemplative mayo. But it's activities and practices and trainings that do not include the preceding elements. It's not exactly necessarily the activity you're engaged in, because I can show you contemplative practices uh, historically for almost anything you can imagine, sexuality, death, even violence and so forth. There are contemplative practices that work with those activities, lots of moving meditations and so forth. So. With that in mind, uh, my question for myself and for the traditions is what if we think of contemplation not as a series of products, but as generative capacities, as deeply human capacities? And when I say generative, what I mean by that is if you have fluency or literacy in this contemplative tradition, whether it's Catholic or Sufi or Judaic or um, Buddhist and so forth, then you have the capacity to generate new forms of contemplation as a particular student requires or a particular context requires. And we certainly have a very distinctive context these days in the world that we've created for ourselves over the last four or five decades. And so what contemplation, what contemplative forms are called into being by that world? Now, people often think who aren't scholars that, hey, that's, no, that's not true. We just always are what we are. Well, I can tell you as someone who studied the historical record, 100% untrue. I hear the same thing from Buddhists. Now they'll say, oh, it's always been like this. And I say, okay, okay. If that makes you feel happy and gets you to sleep through the night. But if you look at the historical record, the forms of contemplation have been extraordinarily adaptive over time, constantly changing in character, even though the tradition often doesn't acknowledge that record of historical change. So if we think of contemplation as a gerund of capacity and using language as an analogy, no one would think like, hey, I'm going to teach my kid um, this language by giving him a bunch of speech products. Hey, here's, here's Steve's great speech, and here's Jay's great speech, and, you know, great speech by Megan and so forth. Just memorize them, kid. 
and you'll, you'll learn how to speak. That's not how you speak. You don't learn products. You learn a set of, uh, of elements, a set of organizational principles, a set of communicative context, and you acquire a generative capacity to be fluent in that language that allows you to generate speech forms in appropriate form on the spot. And I think contemplation is more like that than it is a series of products like we design for American corporations. So if we think that way, we could ask the question uh, by analogy, what are the lexicons of contemplation in a particular tradition? It's not a universalist thing. And so in this tradition, what are the fundamental elements of building blocks? Number two, what are the grammars by extension? What are the organizational principles by which these building blocks are put together and form contemplative practices? I've looked at a particular individual, like in the historical record, and he will teach the same practice in five fundamentally different ways over the course of his corpus. So how do we understand that variation? What's the underlying set of principles from which those are constituted? And finally, there's context. What are the contexts? I'm going to look at this in a moment. Social, philosophical. You could take the same procedural practice and then put it into a Catholic theolo theological um, context, then put it into a Buddhist context. It's going to be a very different practice. The procedural instruction is the same but you're doing it in those totally different contexts. Or, to give you an example from scientific research, which has exploded in contemplation over the last 20 years, uh, initially they weren't controlling for con social context at all. And then they started to control for social context by saying, okay, if we're going to do a group meditation of 10 people, we'll do a group activity of 10 people in the control group who don't meditate. And what they found was all sorts of effects immediately vanished. Why? Because the effects, the positive outcomes, had nothing to do with meditation. They had to do with spending 10, uh, you know, 10 days with 10 people <laughs> and forming a, a relationship of trust. So context. So to look at these one by one, and then to go into uh, a little bit on the deep end on, on one of them, the most difficult one, contemplative lexicon. So what are these atomic building blocks from which contemplative individual practices are fashioned? And so what I've been doing is going through like thousands of pages of descriptions of contemplative practices. And for any individual practice, I will just pick it apart. I will just stumble over every little element and just try to get to the smallest element that is in that practice. It might be a gesture. For example, a really dominant um, meditative gesture in Tibetan Buddhism is dissolution. That's it. Let things go. You visualize something, let it go. Dissolve it. Or you've got a conventional sense of who you are or your body. Before you even start the practice, you dissolve it. So there's this gesture of dissolution. Um, to more complicated things. And so here's a, just a very inadequate kind of list of all the different things that we could start thinking about. We could look at physical elements, breathing techniques. There are so many ways to breathe. And it's not just about Buddhist meditation. You find this all over the, the kind of Christian world, breathing techniques. Uh, postures, gazes, movements, verbal elements, reciting liturgy, reciting prayers, chanting. Silence uh, is a verbal element, cognitive elements. Meditations can be incredibly analytical. I mean, very scholastic, especially in medieval times. They can also be um, a narrative. You can go through a series of narrative entertainments. You're, you're entertaining other forms of life and other possibilities through narration in your contemplation. The senses, uh, they can involve sounds and smells and taste. I've seen meditations for every one of those. Really interesting things. Effective, they can be about compassion or about disgust. Uh, material elements, there's different things like rosaries and, and timers and cushions and other kinds of things. These different contemplative gestures, evocation, bringing something into being, dissolution, letting go, transformation, etc., and different kinds of agents. So you can have an agent of a, of a spirit, a saint, uh, the land itself, your, your spiritual brothers and sisters, um, etc., Philosophical ideas or frameworks, extraordinarily uh, constitutive of what a meditation is. Contemplative micro-modules, you'll find in historic, historical form, entire complex meditations become little modules that suddenly you'll be reading the meditation, you'll say three words, and you'll be like, whoa, that three words are like a whole meditation. But anybody who's involved in that tradition knows exactly what it means. And so you just, you know, you move on. Aesthetic elements, vows or commitments, goals and outcomes adjustments and enhancements, et cetera, and experiences. Every tradition has an ontology, a typology, 
of types of experiences that are going to come and you're going to experience in the context of the contemplative practice in that tradition. And they name these, and they ex interpret what they mean in particular contemplations and how you should respond to them if they emerge, and what value you should give to them. Now, contemplative grammar is a, is a much more complicated one. It's not so difficult to go through and pick out these elements or building blocks, but now to analyze what are the implicit um, organizational principles by which these elements are put together and shaped into a, a whole practice. And I'm going to give you one little analysis of something I've done to do with regards to effort and effortlessness. Um, and this is my initial kind of, you know, it's one of those things I, I know I hear about psychologists where they do a study and you, you think, did you really have to do a study to understand that? I mean, wasn't that, like I think, Jade, you told me about the chocolate one, where they did a study where they gave people a lot of chocolate and didn't give other people a lot of chocolate, and then five months later they found the ones who didn't get the chocolate appreciated the chocolate they were given now more? Okay. <laughs> you know, so... You may think that way about this insight, but I realize that there is this fundamental grammar to Tibetan Buddhist contemplation that has five steps. There's before, there's beginning, there's middle, there's end, and there's after. And each one of these steps has very characteristic elements to it. Now, before is just your preparation. You might have to find a place, you know, create an environment of quiet. Maybe you need to pull together some, like a rosary or a cushion or whatever it might be. The preliminaries is the beginning part of the practice. And that's where you might do things like articulate your intention for yourself. What is my intention for this? Is my intention to solve a medical problem? Is it to generate fundamental wisdom for the purpose of helping others, etc.? cetera? Um, you may also make offerings, offerings to the Buddhas and in the case of Buddhism and so forth, or do other kinds of activity. You might purify the place in which you're meditating. You might uh, subdue obstacles that could potentially interfere with your meditation. And then there's the middle part of the meditation, which is where the bulk of the distinctive activity happens. And then there's the conclusion. And in Tibetan Buddhist meditation, the conclusion of practices is typically about how can I, um, how can I bring the insights and the experiences that emerge in this practice into my life? How can I do that? It also usually involves dissolution so that whatever you are doing during the practice, you dissolve so it doesn't get reified and so forth. And you usually sit in quiet as a way of transiting back to your ordinary life. And then the after-session meditation is really just as important as the session meditation. It's what you do during the day. Now, as you go into your life and work and so forth, how do you remind yourself of what the contemplation was about to trigger those experiences and insights and begin to make it more of a continuous process? Um, and they do the same thing for whole sets of practices. Like contemplation doesn't, as I'm sure you all know, they don't come in isolation. They come in curricula, just like higher education. And so you'll have this practice first, that practice second, and they'll say this practice is a preliminary practice. You do it for six months. This one's the main phase practice. This one is the concluding practice, but they themselves are actually separate practices in their own right. And if you look at it from that linguistic um, analogy, you could talk about well, what's the syntax? What are connectors? What are modifiers? What's punctuation and so forth? Um, and I'm going to quickly go through effort and effortlessness as uh, a kind of analysis I've been engaged in recently, which I have found to be illuminating, but a little bit uh, complex. And so the third part of this, before I go to that, is going to be looking at constitutive context of contemplation. And this is really one of the great misunderstandings of contemporary so-called secular movements in contemplation, where they think, oh, look, look at us, we're doing this and so forth. And my thought is like, you know, you never knew what you were talking about. Like, I mean, it might be what they're doing is useful and good and, 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 and that should be respected. But the idea that they're somehow doing what was being done in these religious traditions, is, it's, it's fool's gold. They're not doing what was done in those religious traditions, nor did they ever understand those religious traditions, because those religious traditions have so many complex, impossibly complex, constitutive contexts that form those traditions in their contemplative practice. So curricular, that that practice was part of an entire curriculum of study and thought and so forth. Or spatial, that they were done in certain kinds of places, like you do it in the, um, you know, a, a basement of Rockne or something, for example, or you do it in the, the cathedral. It can be a very different kind of practice or time. And in particular, um, social, you know, do you do it traditionally together with others? Is that an essential part of the contemplation or do you do it in isolation? 
or philosophical, a, a huge one, like the fact that you do this practice with that theological understanding or that philosophical understanding or you lack it, will, con con will completely change the practice in question, culture, aesthetics, individual differences. There are so many contexts that are potentially, they might be incidental, but they might be fundamentally constitutive of the meaning of that contemplative practice. And if you haven't really studied those and you just pull out that practice like this and think you've got what it was and now you're going to change this and change that and deploy it in, in, uh, in hospitals or schools or whatever, it's just problematic. So finally, um, the genres, what are the varieties of contemplation? And this is a wholly inadequate look just based upon Tibetan Buddhist meditation. You have narrative reflections. Uh, these are like guided narratives or guided existential reflections about the meaning of life and impermanence and, and so forth. And you think about stories. It's, what, it's how the meditation uh, works. And then you have mindfulness, which people hear a lot about these days. I mean, that is a translation of a Sanskrit Tibetan word, which I did know. I just didn't think about the word mindfulness. Attention as a practice, and some people have talked about mindfulness as being attentional practices where you have an intention, you have an attitude, and you observe. So you have an intention, I'm going to intend to um, pay attention to my body, or to my mind, or to my relationships, or so forth. And you have a certain kind of attitude you're taking towards it, and you engage in disciplined observation. Focus, uh, just the development of focused attention the capacity to focus on a statue of a saint or a painting or uh, a candle or whatever it might be, or your breath. Um, insight. These are more analytical, but they don't have to involve analytical reflection. Sometimes they're deeply philosophical meditations. You're really going through a philosophical set of reflections and deliberations. And other times, it's penetrating observations of your experience, of your sensory experience, of the activity that's happening in your mind. And the questioning is not according to a scholastic program, but it's still deeply analytical in character. Deconstructive, where you deconstruct yourself, you deconstruct the world, you deconstruct the ordinary habitual ways in which we perceive and construe of ourself and the world around us and others. And then you have compassion, a very large category of Tibetan Buddhist meditations, which are exploring not just like our ability to empathize with others and visualize ourselves engaging in compassionate activity, but really questioning the boundaries between self and other and permeating those boundaries to understand or, or to viscerally experience them as far more porous than we think. And then compassion begins to flow out of that porosity of the boundaries between you and I and she and he. Visualization meditations, um, obviously a large category in Catholicism as, as well as in Tibetan Buddhism which can be very complex, uh, transferring your identity, questioning your identity, and so forth. Uh, body meditations, meditations about the breath, or meditations that involve postures, or meditations that involve visualizing or sensing different things within your body. And I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we did in Louisville, Kentucky, with six- and seven-year-olds in a public school system there. We just taught them body scans, conjoined with social-emotional learning. And so... We help them just sit and turn their attention to their body. That's it. And just say, how does your foot feel? How does your lower leg feel? And just help them notice what is it like to turn your attention, which usually we just, it's always outside in public education, but now just to turn it inside for a few moments and notice how your body feels. And then when we go through social emotional lessons, we draw upon that capacity to help them understand how does that emotion feel in your body or that social situation. What does your body tell you in terms of how it feels about intuitions with regards to your feelings of safety or threat or whatever it might be? And just helping them connect the dots there. Uh, open awareness meditations, meditations about non-duality of, of, of self and God or self and Buddha or self and reality. Um, natural awareness, letting be, instead of all these acts of focusing and visualization and objects and so forth, the cognitive uh, modality is to let go. Let be. How does it feel to let be, to just let things go? Open awareness, sometimes people talk about it. And then uh, one that I have spent a lot of my time thinking about, which is the self-emergent of the transcendent, that which transcends yourself, that which transcends your intentions and emerges in its own accord into your experience. Something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, which has to do with spontaneous visions and spontaneous experiences where you surrender your agency.
you are no longer in charge. And yet, you are the one who started this meditation. But your mind is not guiding the emergence of what happens. So, um, this is where it goes a little bit uh, deeper. So, transitivity uh, in linguistics. Transitivity is a really simple word. We all understand it. It's words that involve the transfer of energy. Like, I hit the whatever this is, <laughs> right? It involves a subject and an object, and my action transfers energy. My energy is transferred there. So I hit the ball. That's a transitive verb. An intransitive verb is I fell down, right? You didn't push me. I just fell down. So there's no subject and object which are distinct from each other. There's no transfer of energy. And so in linguistics, we talk about um, transitivity as just this kind of division of verbs into transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. And people typically just, that's about all they think about it. Why, why not? You're not a, a necessarily a linguist. But in linguistics, there was really a, a seminal paper by these people, Hopper and Thompson in 1980, that analyzed transitivity uh, into a whole series of modules. And each module is like scalar, which means it's not like yes, no, it's like zero to 10. It can be very intense, it can be less intense, et cetera. And their argument, very influential in linguistics, is that when we say something's a transitive verb or an intransitive verb, that we're drawing upon this innate sense of these modules and, and how intense each one of them is, and transitivity is just the aggregate of that. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly because it's not so important you understand the details, but uh, these are the modules, participants. You need at least two participants to transfer activity. That's obvious. You need myself and a ball to hit. If I just fall down, there's just me. Kinesis, there has to be some action, some kinetic activity. Uh, so they would typically say that like, I like Steve, you know, like I'm not transferring energy to him. I, I, I personally could debate that, but um, aspect, is the action completed or not? Like I hit, completed. But something else might just be it's ongoing. And so the more it's ongoing, the more transitive um, transfer of energy. Punctuality. Um, oh, actually, that's a little bit different. Aspect completed or not. This one is action is ongoing or there's no transition between beginning and completion. You just do it and it's over in an instant. Um, volitionality. How much intentionality am I exercising in the action that I do? Is it just kind of involuntary, you know, reflexive? Am I really deliberate? Like, I'm going to do this. And again, each one of these is like one to 10. And the more they are on one side, the more we perceive that to be transitive. Is it affirmative or negative? Is the verb positive or negative in, in character? Um, mode, is it in the real world or the non-real world? That would be one I'd really have to debate, but you know, this is the real world. <laughs> I close my eyes and imagine stuff. That's the non-real world. Um, agency. How much agency do the participants possess? And then the last couple are, how much does the object get affected? Like, I don't think this was affected at all. But if I had hit a piece of glass, it might have been severely affected. So that would be more transitive in character. And finally, the individuation of the object. How entangled am I the subject with the object? And how much are we separate from each other? So with that in mind, I wanted to think about effort and effortlessness in Buddhist meditation as part of this trying to untangle what's the grammar? What's the meaning of all these different little steps that happen in meditation? How can we understand them? Particularly when it comes around the issues of when I'm exercising effort in meditation and when I'm not exercising effort in meditation. And so when I'm uh, doing things like focusing on an object or I'm getting into a complex posture or I'm visualizing something, these are very effortful. But in other places where I relax, I let go, I wait in the expectation that something will fill my experience, whatever that might be, these are moments of effortlessness. So we can have physical, verbal, so many kinds of effort. And my argument is that it's modular. There's multiple modules. When we say effort and effortlessness, it's not binary. It's not like, oh, that's effortful, that's not effortful. That's effortless, that's not effortlessness. Rather, there's many different modules that go into that perception. And each one is scalar. Each one has intensities. And so you can be intensely effortless, <laughs> or you can be intensely effortful, or you can be modestly effortful, or modestly effortless, and so forth. 
And um, vector fields, which is a very simple thing. It just means what's the directionality of it? Are you going from effort to effortlessness? Are you going from effortlessness to effort? And what kind of effort are you going to, or what kind of effortlessness are you going to? And then these transitions I'm really interested in. When you transit from effort to effortlessness in a contemplative practice, what's happening? Looking at that transition moment. Um, and finally, I'm really interested in who has the agency here. So there are Catholic forms of meditation where God has the agency. There are others where you feel like you have the agency. In the same way in Buddhist meditation, there are moments when most definitely the practitioner is following a script. They have agency, intentionality, effort. In other cases, something else is, take, is, is, being, is the agent. It might be the primordial Buddha. It might be reality itself. But something is stirring and causing your experiences to change and visions to manifest that are not you or not your rational self. Um, so shifting subjects and agency. And see, there can be a lot of activity in an effortless meditation. Why? because you're not the one with the agency, because something transcendent is. And so effortlessness and activity don't directly correlate. It's about who has agency. So with that in mind, I created a scale of, uh, of transitivity and contemplation, but what it really means is the scale of effort and effortlessness in meditation. So I'd look at any given contemplative practice and ask the question like intentionality versus self-emergence. If the practice is super intentional, like everything is something you, in your mind, are going, okay, I do this, I do that, I do this, I do this, very effortful. If it's something where you're mostly being receptive and you're waiting and things are self-emerging, effortlessness. But again, it's a, it's a spectrum, zero to 10. Likewise, scriptedness. The more it's scripted, the more the meditation says, do this, 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 and this, the more effortful it is. The more it has like spontaneous elements to it where you're waiting to see what emerges in your experience and other things. The less scripted it is, the more effortless it is. The more agency you have, the more effortful. The more receptivity you have, the more that you're waiting, the more that you're clearing a space and letting something else fill it, the more effortless. Force, the more force you're applying, the more effortful, the more you're just going with your natural tendencies the more effortless. The more conceptual it is, the more that you're cognitively creating something, the more effortful. The more non-conceptual, effortless. The more you're individuated, the more you have a sharp sense of me as a contemplative practitioner, distinct from others, distinct from reality, distinct from the world around me, the more effortful. The more you're experiencing yourself as deeply entangled with others um, and the world and reality. The more bounded it is, like do this step, that step, this step, that step, and the more fluid, um, effortless. Kinesis and stasis. Um, the more kinetic it is, the more activities there are versus the more it's about stillness. I think that's the first book I ever read about contemplation was the still point of the turning world or something like that, which I read here at Notre Dame. So stillness. Affirmation and negation, positive activity versus negative activity. Um, dissolution versus evocation, dissolving things, more on the effortless side, evoking things, bringing things into presence, more on the effortful side, and an object um, versus subject. If you have external objects that are involved in the meditation, the more effort involved, the more it's involving yourself, your mind, your faith, your emotions, your body, etc., the more effortless. And gradual versus instantaneous. The more gradual the contemplative practice is, step by step, the more things like this happen. For example, a, a visualization, it's like versus a visualization that goes step by step, filling it up. So, and these are six uh, examples, and I'm, I'm watching the time, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Six examples of how such transfers happen. One is habituation. You'll do a meditation over and over and over until it just becomes automatic. Could be a visualization. It could be you just start to perceive the world according to Buddhist doctrine or Catholic doctrine, you know? I mean, whatever doctrine you do over and over and over and meditate on it, you're going to start to see the world that way. So habituation, it becomes effortless, right? Super effortful at start to see the world in that way. But at a certain point, it's like the most natural thing in the planet Earth. But that's different from the dissolution, which is another transition from effort 
to effortlessness. You just let go. So um, you uh, dissolve visualizations. These are various practices I'm not going to get into. Um, there's also exhaustion, where you just, there's meditations where you just engage in frenetic activity of the mind or of the body or of the speech until finally you're so exhausted, you just collapse into a state of, of, of relaxation or naturalness or exhaustion and so forth. Another effort to effortless transition. Or evocation from dissolution. Um, going from a dissolution to evoke something. So you might first dissolve your ordinary perceptions of the body and the world and then regenerate a more divine perception of the world around you. Relational exchanges, where um, you, you're doing moments of like uh, uh, ritual initiations or visions or, or blessings of the lineage or activation of the Gnostic uh, deity in, in these Buddhist meditations that you do, where there's a relational exchange happening where the agent that you're meditating upon begins to become the active agent, kind of similar to how God might fill you in meditation, in the same way the grace of the Buddha descends upon you, and it's no longer you that's visualizing, but the Buddha is, is animating you or filling you. And so these relational exchanges. And then there's the self-emergence. And there's meditations, for example, where you go into darkness and you just wait. There's no visualizations. You just wait. And gradually the darkness is illuminated. So self-emergence. Um, so I'm going to conclude here by talking about the future. So that's, that's the kind of thinking about our heritage of contemplative traditions in these terms of these vocabularies and grammars and contexts and so forth. So we've been looking at design thinking and design processes, and our goal has been to create a design process that is focused on contemplation, that's contemplative in character. And so just really some basics of design thinking. Uh, this is a kind of way to formalize innovation with a formal design process that has mindsets, methods, and toolkits. And uh, Stanford Design School is one of the most famous, has these five steps, um, you know, for empathize, empathize with your customers, the people who want this product, and understand their point of view, understand their situation. And then out of that, you define terms, and then you ideate on it, you, you kind of in an iterative fashion try to brainstorm and think about what can we design that's going to make sense for them. And then you prototype something, and then you test it. Um, and then the IDEO, uh, another famous player in the design um, space, they add this notion of mindsets or attitudes that you can take in the design process. And they also have methods, and this is a threefold method where you um, you first get inspired, and then you ideate, and then you implement. Really the same as the Stanford Design School, just three different terms to talk about these initial moments of discovery and research and understanding and empathy, and then these second moments of really brainstorming about what can we do in this space and so forth, and the third one of where you actually implement things, prototype, test, and, and so forth. And finally, the British Design School has what's called the double diamond, where you discover, you define, you develop, you deliver. Very similar kind of process. Now, what's common about all of these is they have their roots in products designs, you know, making a mouse. Ma not like a, you know, mouse, but a computer mouse, which I've not used in years, but a, a widget. And then later they, they uh, extended this to cover uh, services and processes. And even later they extended it to cover experiences, lives, design your life like um, Steve is teaching. Now, this is the basic pattern in all three of these. This is a picture from, I think, IDEO, where you go wide and you go narrow. So you start by going wide. I need to understand who you are. Oh, now we've got to define terms and get, kind of go narrow. Now we have to ideate and think about all the possible solutions to your needs. Go wide. And now we have to prototype. Let's go narrow and make something. Now we go wide, we test, et cetera. So constantly going wide, going narrow, diverging, converging. And even though they all say it's an iterative process, it looks really linear to me. And this is a picture of the Stanford terms where you see how linear it is, but they have these little dotted lines that say, oh, no, it's not linear at all. It's actually, you know, uh, iterative. You go back and forth and back and forth. So how do we design in a contemplative manner? And this is uh, totally embryonic. We're just in the process of doing this right now uh, with colleagues um, in the design space and contemplative teaching and scholarship. So the idea is, let's have a talos of flourishing. Let's make the goal of the design process to flourish. 
Let's design products, services, experiences that enhance flourishing in the world through greater wisdom and compassion. And number two, let's make it a developmental journey where the designers are not simply like technicians designing a product for you, but they themselves together with their customers are going through a developmental journey that transforms their states of mind, where their states of experience are being paid attention to. And number three, mindsets, letting go. These are drawn from the analysis of the contemplative traditions. Letting go, generativity, questioning, self-emergence, care, methods, spiraling. Uh, and we're trying to play with this metaphor of spiraling instead of the angularity of double diamonds, you know? Spiraling, like a circumambulatory process where you circle in order to understand. So circling through that definition of contemplation I gave you, attention, awareness, reflection, transcendence, employing the formality of beginnings, middles, and ends. And the tools are things like visualization, open awareness, letting go, deep listening, active imagination, waiting, and receptivity. And finally, cosmological care. So just to give a very, uh, I wouldn't even call it a pilot, it's just, it's just something I made for this presentation. But start with cosmological care, where we care for people's cosmos, not simply their products, not simply their little refrigerator kitchen worlds, you know, to design that refrigerator of the future. But we care about their entire cosmos that they live in. And through deep listening, through cultivated empathy, through disciplined attention, we observe and imagine the world of relationships, not just their kitchen, but the cosmos in which they live. And then we spiral in. We define terms, make actionable problem statements that merge the people, the needs, their insights. And then we imagine possibilities. We spiral out. We imagine possible potentials, practices, pathways that might move us towards that world of, of greater wisdom and care. And then we create practices. If we do this process specifically for contemplative practices, we spiral back in and do an iterative generation. And then we test in context and we experience. And we do so with deep consideration of people's um, subjective experiences. So, you know, that, that's really not even a, that's nothing. It's just like a moment on Tuesday, not Tuesday, February. We're looking to deliver a draft form of this. Then we have a, a big design jam in uh, March where we're going to bring together designers and contemplative teachers from across the country to talk about the draft and, and kind of see where we're going to go with it. So the connection there to end, I think that's the last one, oh, contextualizing community, is that I'm doing this work on the, um, uh, the contemplative side, trying to explain like what are the elements of contemplation in this, these traditions and what are the grammars, what are the context, et cetera. And that's fueling into the design toolkit, these little tools that can be used by designers. And then my colleagues on the design side are working on this contemplative design process, and then we're gonna bring the two together in embryonic form uh, early next year. And so my hope is that when we're done with this, uh, that we can begin to be more intentional when we're thinking about like, hey, I wanna design contemplative practices for healthcare or for elementary schools or for kids who are suffering with anxiety problems or whatever it might be, that we can go through a deeply contemplative process that itself embodies the values that we have instead of just you know, calling someone up like I would on Sunday night and say, okay, Monday morning we have our class, what are we gonna meditate on? And then we go, oh, you know? And it gives you the option to be really, uh, not just highly deliberative and intentional, but always check so many different aspects you didn't even imagine were issues. Like you wouldn't ever maybe thought like there's a seasonality to things. That what you teach Notre Dame students in the winter may make no sense at all in the summer. And these things you just, you know, so, this gives you a chance to kind of see all those factors and consider whether they're relevant or not. So uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we have limited time for questions. We have yes. some time. Yes, please. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Maria McKenna. I am struck by the the idea of the future of contemplation and the relationship between that and the our our need to focus on environmental justice and care of of the planet and i wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how that layers on top of this work yeah, so one of my great interests over the past many years has been how these two worlds come into relationship with each other, namely the world of activism, working towards greater justice in this world, especially with regards to these great challenges of climate degradation, 
social inequity and this crisis in well-being, and a life of cultivation of your inner awareness and experience and capacities and so forth, and how to see that these two are really um, go together with each other. I, I've worked so much with INGOs and domestic NGOs, and I think we've all seen so many times where people are doing incredible work, but they haven't taken responsibility for their lives, and they do incredibly damaging work. Even They undo the good work that they do. And so I see these two as really coming into relationship with each other. Our initial pilot was actually going to be about environmental justice work, and we're now putting that off probably to a year from now. But one of my colleagues who's part of this project, who's a, um, an academic as well as a contemplative teacher, he's been doing a lot of work with going to environmental sites and creating contemplative practices that are 100% adapted for that situation and that fight, like on a, a, a you know, site of environmental poisoning and so forth, and really trying to take this approach in a in his own experience, and craft contemplations that make perfect sense for that particular context. And one of the things I've been interested in over time is on environmental issues, we've been making data-based arguments for a long time, and we should continue to do so. And for many people, it's had a very strong impact, but for many people, they just don't care. So why don't we complement that with creating learning environments where people can have visceral experiences of the more than human world with the hope that this might change some of their sensibilities and then have them open to these kind of conversations. So one of the things we did at the University of Virginia, which I was not directly involved with, but my colleagues were, was they um, com connected uh, religious studies, environment, and music to think about those kinds of environmental issues. And so that we have this long-standing National Science Foundation-funded uh, activity at the Chesapeake Bay. And they took high-fidelity acoustic equipment from the music department, and they inserted these little microphones, non-damaging, into the uh, oysters in the bay. And then on the spot, the scientists who'd been working there for like 20 or 30 years, they sonically immersed into the life of those oysters. And it was really startling, because I think for all these years, they had thought these oysters were just so, you know, quiet and whatever, they're not quiet at all. They're extraordinarily articulate and expressive sonically, if you listen. And the high fidelity microphones on the spot just immerse them in that sound in the way that um, is really compelling. And so to suddenly hear the noise and the expressivity of those oysters had a dramatic effect on those scientists. And so that's just a small example of how technology, the arts, and contemplation can bring you into a different kind of sensibility and thereby open up a space for dialogue. But my, my colleague, Adam Lobel, who's uh, currently in Pittsburgh, he's been doing some really amazing work with environmental meditations uh, that aren't, there's, they're not traditional in any fashion of the sense. He's just taking his own fluency and using it to adapt things that make sense for those environmental locations. So. Thank you for an amazing articulation of what contemplation is. I wish I had heard this talk 30 years ago uh, because of the, how um, articulate that is. Uh, I want to draw you out a little bit on what you said earlier about the context that we have for mindfulness and meditation. Two things I run into often is where people equate meditation with mindfulness automatically, and they prescribe it even though they may never have done it. So we inflict that on each other. You should be mindful, you should meditate. And then the second one is, uh, uh, when I go into certain groups, they already have a repulsion because they have been, um, in the, uh, uh, maybe a, a distilled version has been imposed on them as a group. Or, um, and, and so uh, sometimes I have to work through those two barriers in order to help them. Uh, uh, can you comment on what that, uh, any suggestions for that context? Yeah, I, I think that's probably why I have an allergy to the word mindfulness, um, because it, it suggests this kind of overly normative sense of what we're doing, like it's this way of doing it and there's no other way. And um, so I like to really approach things more from the perspective of not talking about something pre-formulated, but rather just engaging in this kind of set of reflections like I did at the beginning. Let's think about the practices that we engage in and how those practices are generative of outcomes. And rather than start from the beginning, like um, I'm going to teach you about this ancient Buddhist thing, mindfulness or this ancient Jesuit practice of, you know, Ignatian visualizations or whatever it might be to just go th lead them through a deliberate process so they can see that they're already doing these things. And you're just asking them to be a little bit more 
intentional about thinking about what you're doing and what the outcomes um, are. For example, uh, literacy. I mean, what an intentional practice that is, right? That's an amazing, amazingly rigorous practice where we have our kids focus their attention on those letters from left to right and decode the mean and so forth. There's all sorts of ways that we teach attention or we train our emotions or our, our sensibilities and so forth. And so when I talk to students or people that aren't immediately receptive, um, I tend to kind of pull back at that level and then gradually work our way into thinking about um, how we might make sense of some of these things. And, and, and I really draw that from how I used to teach uh, large lecture classes like Teach Tibetan Buddhism where you know, most students at Virginia are just going to be like, ah, what's that? You know, and they have all sorts of crazy thoughts that I want to disabuse them of. And so when we go into a subject matter for a class, I'll typically, because it's like 200, 300 students, I'll ask, what can I ask them that they will 100% be super excited to engage in and that I have some plausible thought that I can lead back to the subject matter at hand? And so I'll ask them questions, and they'll just be, they'll, even, they'll get so excited they'll forget that this, why is he even talking about this? This has nothing to do with Tibetan Buddhism. But they'll be super excited, super engaged, and so forth. And then, somewhere along the way, I have to perform the magic of figuring out how do I show them that that's actually totally relevant to what we're going to be talking about with regards to Tibetans and Buddhists and so forth. And so in the same way with contemplation, I like to think, like, what can we start from that 100% I know is going to resonate with you? I know you're going to have things to say about and things to talk about. And then along the course of the way, after I see that you're fully engaged or we're fully engaged, then I can begin to lead it back to something that involves thinking about um, deliberate practices. And if people don't want to say contemplation, there's no need to use the word contemplation and certainly not mindfulness um, because these are just human capacities. I mean, our, our species was born through reflection, through the opportunity for um, introducing a contemplative pause between our instinctual, between a situation and our instinctual response. So language and the, the growth of our minds and so forth, they, they brought this capacity. So it's really our birthright. And if we think that way, then it just becomes very hard to kind of contest. So, you know, and that's that, that first stage of just empathizing with, with how are they thinking? How are they talking? What's going to resonate with them? Um, so I don't use, I mean, I, I'm really deep into this. So in the Buddhist context, and so I don't feel the need to use any of that language because I know that's so distant, right? it's so complex. And so I'm just happy to talk in whatever way makes sense for them and then just slowly get, get our way back. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, I, I think that um, because of, I, feel, I feel like we could have a, a really long and rich conversation um, going forward because I think the, what you did here is, Dominic suggested, I think you did on the typology of the, the contemplation, it was really rich and deep. And then I felt like in the last 15 minutes, you kind of brought in this whole other language and a whole other methodology around design thinking and thinking about inspiration and ideation and implementation and this dialogue with contemplation that I just think is fascinating and opens up so many possibilities going forward. And like I said, I'd love to, as somebody who teaches on design thinking, um, continue in dialogue. And as I imagine many here 